Good morning, everyone. It is the Fed League Flash for Sunday, June 29th, and we're going to cover something that some people might think is pretty controversial, but hear me out on this. All right, the topic today and question that we're raising is, is the FPHL, the Fed, winning the war for single A supremacy? All right. Um, now, I understand and I acknowledge and I agree with the fact that as of right now, as we're talking, the caliber of play and the, the hierarchy for the minor leagues, the SPHL is a tiny step above the FPHL. It used to be a huge gap between the two. Not the case anymore. Um, and we're going to break this down, uh, go through this. Uh, I apologize. Um, a as I was uh, researching all the information, I had a lot of different notes and uh, compacting it all down into a, you know, a small video here. Um, it was a little a bit of a challenge. But anyway, all right. The SPHL, originally the Southern Professional Hockey League, it's not officially that anymore, is 20 years old. It's celebrating its 20th year this upcoming season. Meanwhile, the Fed is heading into its 15th year. So there's a five-year gap. Uh, the SP uh, started first, obviously, and... Uh, there hasn't been the amount of turnover and uh, franchise stability in the SP that there has been in the Fed, but don't let that deceive you. All right, the SPHL started with nine teams. At least that was their design. They said, okay, we're going to start playing this next year, 2004, 2005, with nine teams. One, there was an issue with the charter, so got downgraded to eight. All right, they started off in markets like Columbus, Winston-Salem, uh, Huntsville and Knoxville, still original teams. Uh, they started in Macon, um, which, of course, there's a team in Macon now, different franchise. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, you know, they had the core of their location. Now they're located in the South, hence Southern Professional Hockey League. Meanwhile, when the Fed started, they started with six, all right around New York. Very small footprint. All right, starting in smaller rinks. Uh, at the time that they started, the largest rink was Danbury. Uh, on a really good day, you can cram about 3,100 people into Danbury Ice Arena. All right. Meanwhile, uh, Huntsville, um, you know, that's a 6,000 some seat facility. Uh, Columbus, we're familiar with. You can seat about 7,400 in there. So, you know, they're in bigger arenas. Um, that. Okay. Um, now, obviously, you start a new league, you're going to go through some growing pains. By year five, the SP was down to six teams. Um, so there was some uh, subtraction by attrition uh, due to a multitude of reasons. Uh, the Fed, um, they tried expanding right away. Uh, the SP really didn't go nuts with expansion. Uh, first couple of years, they tried one or two new markets. Uh, the Fed immediately tried to jump from six to nine in one year. Um, generally speaking, didn't work out, but, uh, you know, they, they, they gave it a go by year four, the fed was down to four teams and things were looking pretty bleak, but then things turned around. Now, as far as the rate of growth for both leagues, the SP by, by year 10, by their 10th anniversary season, they were up to 10 teams. Likewise with the fed. In the 2019-2020 season, um, they had 10 teams, um, and then unfortunately COVID hit. Um, 
obviously the effects of COVID, it hit the Fed harder than it hit the SP. And a lot of that was because of the markets that the, the teams were in. But nonetheless, all right. As far as expansion goes, um, okay, it started off with a basic footprint, SPHL down in the southeast. They expanded to the Midwest um, in year 10, getting in places like Peoria and Evansville. All right. Uh, the Fed expanded to the Midwest year two. Uh, you had your first year, everyone's right around New York. Second year, Danville Dashers. Uh, by year eight, they started their move into the South, which has been very, very successful and is really one of the hallmarks as far as the growth of the league, um, uh, the strength of the franchises. So uh, over the course of several years in the early 2010s, um, okay, the SP started having some problems as far as losing some cities that eventually would end up becoming Fed cities. And interesting comparison coming up. Okay, they lost Winston-Salem in 2009. Uh, now there were three years of teams being in Winston-Salem for the SP. Best year that they drew was 1,500 per, per game. That was their fan draw. Now you look at the Thunderbirds, they're drawing 2,900. And, you know, their, their capacity, their percentage of capacity is 97%. So, big change. Mississippi. All right, the Mississippi Surge in the SP, playing in Biloxi, couldn't draw above 2,600. Two years with the uh, with the Fed version of the Sea Wolves, they've drawn 2,900 plus. Columbus never got above 3,200 in a year with the draw. All right, um, and as a matter of fact, at the end of the Columbus Cotton Mouths, they were only pulling in 2,200 fans into that nice big arena. All right, the Fed comes in. They're drawing 3,500 a game. Um, Danville, different story. Uh, Danville for the Fed only drew over 1,000 three times in their 10 years. But, um, you know, they were they were pretty steady. They held pretty steady. In an arena that seats 2,350, that's something that the new dashers need to work on, marketing and getting fans in the gates. Um, the first year that the Vermilion County Bobcats, which was a huge mistake, poor judgment by the SP, um, they drew 1,400 fans, but then the second year, they couldn't even get 500 fans in. So it was, it, it was not a good situation, obviously. Um, See, the Fed has had a lot of different markets and a lot of instability, so it seems, but they're able to basically take the philosophy, let's throw things against the wall, see what sticks, and stay with that. We'll cut our losses when something doesn't stick, and that's what they've done, and they've been able to survive that. Um, now, the SP, they tend to put all of their eggs in one basket when they have looked to new markets. And now they've gone to the opposite extreme where they're looking at new markets and saying, hmm, do we want to take this chance? Probably not. Um, they're losing out. And their last expansion endeavor, the Vermillion Bo County Bobcats, uh, that's still biting them in the backside. Uh, there is still fallout happening from that uh, big lawsuit that's going to be starting in November and uh, could very well change the way, force the SP to change the way that they do business. Um, but in the meantime, uh, over the last three or four years, the SP has examined expansion and has lost out on opportunities. They had an opportunity in Greensboro, North Carolina, backed out of the deal. They were originally supposed to have Athens, 
But, again, the league backed out of the deal. Clarksville. Everything was all set. They were going to Clarksville. Now, very questionable. Um, it's, it's like they just can't pull the trigger. Um, meanwhile, they're also having trouble drawing in some of their cities. Okay, Peoria is only filling up to 40% capacity. Evansville, 36%. Fayetteville, 42%. Macon, 30%. Two percent. So you have four of your ten markets. You can't even fill the place halfway. Um, that's losing a lot of money. All right. Meanwhile, you have the Monroe moccasins coming into the Fed this next year. Already, already they have thirty-three hundred plus inquiries for season tickets for a fifty-six hundred seat arena. So that barn's going to be full. All right, Athens looking like they're going to draw well, uh, despite their ticket prices. Um, Baton Rouge, first year in the league, and they lead the league in attendance. Uh, there's major upticks in attendance in Danbury and in Binghamton and in Carolina. The attendance numbers keep going up every year. Um, the Fed's doing something right. So the question is, why is the SP having such problems? Um, you know, you, you look at them, they haven't had any expansion since 2018. It's when the Quad City, because uh, I'm not counting Vermillion, because that was just a bad mistake. Uh, Quad City was the last team that came in and has helped. Um, and that was six years ago. Now, some may argue, well, that's stability. Well, is a stability or is a stagnation? Um, I, I think it's the latter of the two um, because, again, they've had opportunities to expand and they haven't taken it. Meanwhile, the Fed has seen that and said, we're going to get aggressive. You know, we, we're, we're going into uh, Monroe. We're going back to, uh, to Danville. We're going into Athens. We are uh, going into Beaumont, into Topeka, um, probably placing another team in Louisiana next year. Um, the exact site unknown, but it's in the works. So they are working on growing, and they're being very aggressive about it, partly because they see... The SP's not doing that well. They're not making money. The SP is not making money. All right. Um, so the Fed is really going all gung-ho. And now in the last four years, the league has doubled from 7 to 14. So uh, obviously, probably not all those markets are going to stick. But you're moving in the right direction in minor league hockey you have instability so you try to be aggressive in your your game plan with expansion and uh with your reach and it usually pays off more often than it doesn't all right um going a little long here so let's kind of start to wrap this up um the talent level it has been shrinking. Uh, hockey experts look at the Fed and look at the SP and say, right now, okay, everyone that plays in the SP can play in the Fed and play well. Not everyone in the Fed could play in the SP well. But that gap has been shrinking exponentially over the last few years. Um, since COVID, the talent influx has uh, the increase of the talent level, the influx coming in has increased at a much greater rate in the Fed than it has in the SP. All right, a lot of talented players. And now we have, last year, you have players like uh, um, Michael Marcheson, who played with the Hat Tricks a couple years ago, uh, Yaroslav Yavdakamov, I had to get that name in. Uh, from Mississippi, jump right to the ECHL, which is another point I'm going to get to in just a minute here. 
All right. Uh, that is huge. And it's only a matter of time before the Fed surpasses the SP in talent level. And it's going to happen because of what's going on behind the scenes with the business models. All right. Um, it, new fans, drawing in new fans. This is another huge thing. All right. Your opportunity for watching the SP is you go to the games or you pay for flow hockey to stream the games. $30 a month. Uh, the last I heard, thirty dollars a month, and it's like one hundred and eighty dollars for the year to watch hockey. Now, flow hockey is a good service because you don't get just the SP. You can also watch the East Coast. You can watch uh, uh, Junior A. You can watch the USHL. But that's a lot of money. Okay, if you're a new fan, are you going to pay thirty dollars a month? to watch uh, the Roanoke Rear Yard Dogs, or well, you could be watching the Blue Ridge Bobcats for free on YouTube. And every team is free on YouTube in the Fed. Great way to draw on money. Yeah, the Fed is losing out on a chunk of change that they could be putting in their pockets, but they recognize it's better to draw in fans, get in, the influx of fans through a free service to use as basically free advertising to get them encouraged. Hey, go to a game, go watch a game. And people are doing that because we've seen the, um, in eight of the 11 markets this last year, attendance went up. So people are going to the games. People are spending the money to go to games because they got turned on by watching YouTube. That's how I found the, the, the fed by watching on YouTube, fell in love with it, went to games. So, um, and, and it's working. And, you know, the SP is kind of holding themselves back by hiding behind a pay streaming service that they might get some revenue back, but not enough to recoup the amount of customers that they aren't reaching. So, all right. Uh, the style of play, it's more wide open the Fed. Uh, you have more scoring, um, but there's still good defensive play developing in the Fed. Uh, it's more exciting uh, than the SP. The SP is becoming kind of a niche league. Um, you know, if, if you've always been a Peoria Riverman fan, you're a Peoria Riverman fan. But, you know, if you're a new fan, you're more likely to want to check the dashers out this next year than you are to check out Peoria. All right. Um, the, the biggest thing that that's changed over the last few years, I, I talked about the, uh, the increase or, or, or the narrowing of the gap of the town. All right. The SP is also unfortunately gaining a little bit of a reputation among players. It's kind of seen as a good old boys club. And the SP is not the destination that it used to be. It used to be the goal for everyone who came to the Fed. All right, my next step, I want to work on getting into the SP. Then maybe I can go to the ECHL, see how far it takes me. Now, I know of seven players specifically who have said in the last two weeks, have said, I have absolutely no interest in going to the SP. I'm going to try for an ECHL camp this next year. If I don't make it, I'll come back to the Fed. Seven, seven people I've heard say that. All right. It's like, I'm going to try to make it, but it's ECHL or I'm back here. So, you know, people, players are not seeing the FPHL as the bottom rung anymore, all right? That image is starting to break and shed. So yeah, the SP is in, is in real trouble. Um, and a lot of it, again, is because they've just failed to seize a lot of opportunities. Um, and now they've got this lawsuit hanging on their backs. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see how that turns out. Um, if you want more information on the lawsuit, uh, I recommend that you go to Two Minutes for Roughing. 
uh, go back into some of the podcasts that talks about the Vermilion County Bobcats. There, uh, they give a lot of details as far as you know, what this lawsuit is all about, who it entails, what it entails. Uh, check them out. But there we go. Um, we are on a trajectory in which the Fed could very easily supplant and maybe even replace the SP in a matter of just a few seasons. Um, th that, that's the trajectory that we're on. Um, so that's why I raise this, this whole point. And yet again, it sounds a lot of, it sounds controversial, especially to us older fans who, you know, have grown up with a certain hierarchy, but that's changing. So, um, yeah, expecting big things from the Fed in the next couple of years. Again, that's why they were so aggressive. That's why they pushed in three teams this year, because they see an opportunity. Um, we'll see what happens. All right, so let me know what you think. Leave a comment down below. Um, even, you know, if you don't agree, that's fine. You can tell me, dude, you're off your rocker. Uh, but I really believe, as I've been looking and watching it, uh, this whole scenario unfold that we are seeing a definite shift in you know the the single a structure in uh, in pro hockey so we will see all right thank you for watching make sure on Tuesday tune in to Facebook live we'll catch you up on all the news of the last few days and uh, we'll go on from there all right Thanks for watching, guys. I'm Gary Ryan for the Fed League Flash. Have yourself a great rest of the weekend.